no computer. Thank you. No. Thank you all, um, and thank you very much, Bruce. I just would like to say before I begin that Cold Spring Harbor has been so important to this whole process, um, from the early exposure to some of the people whom I've quoted in the book, um, the opportunity to interact with scientists and really understand what's happening in some of the fields that I've covered, Bruce's very generous uh, offer to review uh, large parts of the manuscript for scientific accuracy, so I'm feeling deeply indebted to Cold Spring Harbor. And this is the first talk I've given about the book, so if it's rambling and incoherent, that's why. Um, <laughs> but, um, but very gratefully. So I'll tell you a little bit uh, about the idea of the book. About 10 years ago, I was assigned to write a story for the New York Times Magazine about the deaf. And when I got the assignment, I thought that deafness was simply a disability, a terrible disadvantage, those poor people, what a shame they couldn't hear, what could be done for them. And then I went out into the deaf world and the deaf culture, which is somewhat more visible now than it was 20 years ago, and discovered that many deaf people actually claim deafness as a cultural identity, that for many of those people, the experience of deafness is primarily one of using sign language, that people are deeply attached to sign language, American sign language by and large here, as an expressive means, and that many of these people didn't want to be cured. They didn't want to hear. They didn't want to be different from how they were. And I also discovered, as I continued to work in that community, that most deaf children are born to hearing parents, and that it's those parents who tend to think my child would have a better life if my child could hear, and who try to focus on getting the child to develop oral skills for language and communication, um, the ability to lip read, the ability to be, in effect, part of the same world those parents inhabit. And often, it's after that's gone on for some time that those children in adolescence discover the deaf world, deaf culture, sign language, and for them it comes as a great revelation, and they begin to experience uh, the world of the deaf. The whole narrative was very familiar to me, because I'm gay, and most gay people are born to straight parents. And those straight parents frequently think that those children would do better if they could just function in the normal world. Um, perhaps a few fewer parents think that now, but certainly historically that's what parents have thought. And so I wrote about the deaf experience, and I wrote about the parallel with the gay experience. I talked about how gay people also, in adolescence, finally find a community and finally find an identity. And then a friend of a friend had a daughter who was a dwarf. And she began describing her concern. Should I join the little people of America? Should I tell her she's just like everyone else, only kind of short? And as she talked about it, I thought, it's the same thing all over again. And I discovered that most dwarfs are born to parents of average height. And so I became interested in the idea that there are many of these conditions which are not shared generationally. And I've proposed as sort of the central argument of the book that we're all very aware of what I've called vertical identities, identities that are passed down from generation to generation, as beautifully demonstrated by the exponents of uh, eugenics, about whom we heard just a moment ago, um, and that those identities um, are shared. So ethnicity, for example, is a vertical identity. Most people have children of their ethnicity, complexities in cross-cultural marriages and so on, but in general. Nationality is usually uh, something that's vertical. Uh, religious. Uh, religion is usually something that's vertical. But there are a lot of these horizontal identities, and I call them horizontal identities because they're identities that people learn not from a peer group, but rather from, I mean, not from their uh, parents, but rather from a peer group. They learn them from people who are in their generation. And so I was very interested in looking, what are those identities, and how do they fit together, and what meaning can one tease out of the fact that they exist, and how are they how are they profoundly different from the other identities? And the primary difference is that vertical identities passed down generationally are usually things in which people feel a certain amount of pride, and they're not things that people are usually trying to change. So you could make the argument that it's quite difficult in the United States, as it's currently constructed, to be an African American, the um, post-racial presidency notwithstanding. But there is no research going on that says, but life is so hard for black people, let's alter their genes so that they all come out with pale skin and blonde hair. 
But there is endless research on trying to address these various horizontal identities because people are not taught from earliest childhood that they should feel proud of and good about who they are. And when I looked at the deaf community, what I discovered is that there's a real divide between deaf children of deaf parents, the so-called deaf of deaf, and deaf children of hearing parents. Contrary to what many people might have expected, because the deaf parents are often in a more marginal place in the society, it's the deaf children of deaf parents who are higher functioning than the deaf children of hearing parents, because they share an identity with their family, which is a very valuable thing to have, and because their self-esteem gets reinforced from a very early age. Many of those children, even though they are deaf and they use sign language at home, become fluent in sign language very early. And they can then learn English as a second language, and many of them end up reading and writing very well. Many deaf children of hearing parents, on the other hand, are not exposed to sign language early. It may take them a long time to be exposed to it. It may take them much longer to gain fluency. And all this focus on English actually gets in the way of their having language at all. It's not that if you forbid sign and teach English, they'll speak better English. If you forbid sign and teach English, then they may very well not develop linguistic fluency. And the language centers in the brain are very much open to the receiving of grammatical structure and of language in very young children. The acquisition of language appears to begin, in fact, in utero. There are lots of tests that show that a fetus who's become accustomed to the sounds of one language will respond to those sounds differently from how he will respond to the sounds of other languages. So this begins very early, this process. If you bring up children and decide not to expose them to sign, as many hearing parents traditionally have done, what you may end up with is not a child who functions in English, but a child who passes the critical window for the acquisition of language without acquiring language at all. There's a drama going on at the moment, which is that for the deaf, there is uh, the world of sign language, and there has been this world of political activism and liberation. And as those movements have unfolded at the exact same time, medicine has progressed. The cochlear implant has been introduced, which effectively addresses deafness in most people. It doesn't exactly make people hearing, but it allows sound to be transmitted, bypassing the cochlea, and go directly to the centers in the brain where sound is processed. And so we have this sort of strange drama, which is that it gets better and better to be deaf. The politics have changed, the social acceptance has changed, the recognition of deafness as a culture has advanced. Gallaudet University educates deaf people in their own language. It gets better and better to be deaf. And at the exact same time, it gets rarer and rarer because fewer and fewer people are functionally deaf because of the advent of the cochlear implant. And the tension between an attempt to respect the cultural nature of something and an attempt to address the medical issues of something seems to me a very, a very intense one and a very complex one and a very central one to the questions of medical ethics that we're all here to think about. So I became very interested in looking at how that process unfolds. And I eventually felt that there are two ways of describing almost any condition. There is a way of describing it as an illness and a way of describing it as an identity. And those categories are very fluid, and I ultimately thought almost everything can be experienced as an illness and as an identity, and that the choice that we're constantly being asked to make is a very real one. My feeling about the deaf culture is that it's not my culture, and I don't particularly want to join it, but it's every bit as coherent as any of the cultures in which I do participate. It seemed to me as coherent as as coherent as gay culture, as coherent as Jewish culture, as coherent as American culture. It is its own culture. Whether you would like to be a member of it, or indeed whether you would like your child to be a member of it, is another question. If I had a child, I would probably get cochlear implants. I think it's terribly important to be able, if I had a deaf child, excuse me, I do have a child, but if I had a deaf child, I would probably get cochlear implants because the ability of a parent to communicate with his own children is one of the most important things that there is in bringing up a child. And because I think the deaf culture seems a little marginal to me. But I have great respect for the idea that others would think otherwise. 
And I'm particularly well placed to appreciate this shift from an illness to an identity model out of my own experience. I'm going to read you something that was in Time magazine um, the year that I turned two. Even in purely non-religious terms, homosexuality represents a misuse of the sexual faculty. It is a pathetic little second-rate substitute for reality, a pitiable flight from life. As such, it deserves fairness, compassion, understanding, and when possible, treatment. But it deserves no encouragement, no glamorization, no rationalization, no fake status as minority martyrdom, no sophistry about simple differences in taste, and above all, no pretense that it is anything but a pernicious sickness. So that's not really that long ago. I'm not that old. That was 1965, um, and, uh, or 66. And, uh, that was the way that homosexuality was being described in Time magazine, which was at that point really the, the voice of America in a way, and certainly not a particularly conservative publication. In my adult life, I have a husband, I have children, I'm here talking to you all about this topic um, at Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Clearly, that's not the way that people, uh, or at least that many people think about homosexuality now. And I thought, OK, if homosexuality and illness could turn into gayness and identity, if deafness as an illness and disability could emerge into the deaf culture, which is something of an identity, if dwarfism, as it turned out, which seems to be a terrible affliction, could also give people who had it an identity, then what other groups must there be going through this same process? falling in the same interstitial vacuum between illness and identity where these arguments were going on. I looked at a vast number of topics, and I ended up narrowing my scope to 10. I wrote uh, about deafness, dwarfism, Down syndrome, autism, schizophrenia, multiple severe difficulty, uh, disabilities, uh, about prodigies who are also quite overwhelming and daunting for their families. Um, and represent, in a way, equally serious anomalies, um, about families of people who commit crimes and about families of people who are transgender. And in looking at those groups, I tried consistently to address the question of, are parents able appropriately to love and to accept their children? And I would emphasize that loving your child and accepting your child are not always the same thing. Um, and the people who have got these various conditions can they argue that they are identities? In what ways do they function as identities, even when those arguments aren't explicitly made? And I became very interested in the quality of resilience that I detected, not only in the people who had those conditions, but also in their families. And I decided to focus on families because there are really three levels of acceptance involved with anything as an identity. There's self-acceptance, there's family acceptance, and there's acceptance by the society at large. Because these are by and large conditions that affect people who are born with them or who develop them fairly early, the role of family is very important. This fact of it not being an identity shared with parents is central. When people win over their parents, it's a template for how one goes about winning over the society. And when a parent decides to look at that child with respect and to accord that child dignity, that's actually a template for how the larger society might respond to their children. So parents are at an incredibly important nexus in this, um, in this whole process, and family is central to an understanding of these conditions. I'm going to read you a few excerpts from things that people I talked about had to say to give you a feeling for some of what is there, and also to give you a feeling for some of how people relate to identity. This is from a letter that a deaf friend of mine sent to me, someone I got to know through this research, but who became a friend and actually helped with research on the book. And I said to him at one point, how do you feel about the cochlear implant thing? And he said, while I'm pretty comfortable with my disability and don't see cochlear implants as an evil force intent on destroying the deaf culture, I do get a sense of impending extinction. There will always be deaf people worldwide, but there is a real possibility 
that it'll be near eradicated in developed countries within the next 50 to 100 years. I say near because there will always be immigrants, untreatable conditions, cultural holdouts, and so on. But no more people like me. Now, some deaf people, and I'll move on to the other topics in a moment, but some deaf people have expressed the wish to have deaf children. And some of them have actually pursued, back to the eugenic conversation, the idea of having um, pre-implantation genetic diagnosis to select for deaf children. And others who have not gone that route have chosen simply to make sure that they are having a child with someone who has a dominant hereditary form of deafness. So there was a singles ad that I saw at one point while I was working on this, which said, single white male seeks single white female with Connexin 21 deafness. Two people with Connexin 21 will always have children who are deaf. That whole process of wanting to have children who are like them has become a source of incredible argument and debate. It's up there with patenting genes. And people have said, how can you do that? How can you disable these children? Well, there are two points to be made. One of them is that you are not disabling the children. You don't take hearing children and drive a needle through their eardrum. You're choosing to create these children and if you chose to create other children, these children wouldn't exist. It's not that you could have these children and they would have hearing. But the other piece of it is that many people want to have children who are like them. I started off by saying that it's very important as a parent to be able to communicate with your child. If your language is ASL, you might like to have a child whose primary language was ASL too. It may be that you could have a child who also spoke ASL, but there's a sense that that child wouldn't be a participant in the world and the culture that you came from. I'm not part of that culture. It's not what I would want to do. But I think to say to people, you can't have a child who is deaf. You can't have a child who is like you. We see that as a problem. Gets to be a kind of coercive eugenics and can be very dangerous. Um, there were a dwarf couple whom I interviewed who needed to have IVF in order to have a child. They went to have IVF, and they simply wanted to have an embryo transferred, or a couple of embryos transferred. And the doctor said, we'll have to do pre-implantation genetic diagnosis and determine which are the healthy embryos not affected with dwarfism. And the parents, both dwarfs, said, we would just like you to choose at random. And if we have a child who's a dwarf, we'll bring that child up to be a dwarf. We have very happy, fulfilling lives and actually would have a lot to give to such a child. And five clinics that they went to refused to do that. They all insisted that there was a need to implant only healthy embryos. And in Great Britain, there was a law, the Human Embryology and Fertility Act, which actually says that it is illegal to implant an uh, embryo known to have a genetic defect. Um, there's another slippery slope here. What is a genetic defect? What is too much of a genetic defect? What does it mean to be designing children not to have them? I had a lot of moving experiences while I was working on the dwarfs chapter. Um, and one of the things that I uh, found, there was a, a family I interviewed who had a son. He was born, and when he was born, he was diagnosed with diastrophic dwarfism, which is an extremely disabling condition. And the doctor said to the mother, um, they said, this kid is never going to even recognize you. He's never going to walk. He's never going to develop. He's just going to die fairly soon. And it might be easier for you just to leave him at the hospital. You don't even have to see him. We'll take care of it. And we'll watch over him until he dies. And she said, no, that's, that's my child. And I want to see my child. So they brought the child. And she and her husband agreed that they would take him home and do their best. And they said, if it all goes horribly wrong, it goes horribly wrong. But at least we'll have tried. So Clinton, um, his name is Clinton Brown. Clinton had 30 major surgeries before the time he turned 12 and spent a great deal of time in hospitals. His mother works in a, a call center. His father is a construction worker. They didn't have a lot of resources. And when he was born 30 years ago, there was no internet, and they couldn't go online to find things out. But somehow his mother found the best doctor for the treatment of diastrophic dwarfism, who was at Johns Hopkins, and took him down there. Over the period of time that he was down there and stuck in this hospital all the time, he thought, I don't have anything else to do. So he worked on learning things. Um, 
he ultimately became the first person in his family to go to college. Um, and he went to college, his family lives uh, here on Long Island, he went to college nearby, he went to Hofstra, and his mother described, and he eventually, he's uh, just under three feet tall, um, he can walk with difficulty, but he can walk. Uh, his mother described driving home one day and going past a bar, and he had this specially fitted car that he can drive. And she said, I saw Clinton's car there, and I thought, oh my God, the other guys drink two beers, they're six feet tall, he's three feet tall. It's like he's drinking four beers. She said, what am I, and she got really worried, and she thought, I just, I, he shouldn't be in a bar, and what's going on, and he's not even really legally drinking age, and she got home, she thought, I can't go in there and interrupt him, but she got home, and she left a bunch of messages on his cell phone, and she was sitting there, and she said, and then I suddenly thought, if someone had said to me that my future problem would be that I worried he was gonna go out drinking and driving with his college buddies, I would have been so glad to have that problem. And I'm just gonna read you a little quotation from her, because I said, how did it happen that he seemed so unpromising and that he emerged in this way? She said, I don't think we did anything to make him into him. What did I do? I loved him, that's all. The other day, these people, much higher up than us socially, much more educated, called me up and said they couldn't handle this. They were in Texas politics and thought the stigma would be harmful to them. And they gave their baby up for adoption. That's just what they were going to do. And it's the opposite of what I was going to do, right from the beginning. The other day, Clinton came home and he goes, Ma, I saw a blind man today with a stick in Manhattan. There were people rushing back and forth, and he was all alone. I just felt like crying, I felt so sorry for him. So I offered to bring him to where he needed to go. Clinton just always had that light in him, and we were lucky enough to be the first to see it there. So I found that a lot of these stories were stories of these extraordinary triumphs of love, and that a lot of them involved people who eventually said how glad they were to have um, the children that they had. And I found that a lot of them also had very enriching experiences within the condition that their child had. So there was a family I talked to who, to me, in a way, sort of summed up this central message. They're called Tom and Karen Robards. They live in New York. They have two disabled children, one of whom has Down syndrome. And they became, after he was born, activists in the field of Down syndrome and really brought about a revolution in the way that kids with that condition are educated. And they've worked very hard on it, and their son is now in his early 30s. And I said to them, you know, this has been so central to your lives. I said, do you wish it had never happened? Do you wish your son didn't have Down syndrome? Do you wish you'd never heard of Down syndrome? And his mother said, for my son, for David, I wish that he didn't have it because it's a difficult way to be in the world. And for David, I wish I could make it go away because I would like to make life as easy for David as I possibly can. She said, but speaking for myself, it's changed me so much and given me so much richer and better a life than I would ever have had and made me so much better of a person than I ever would have been that speaking for myself, I wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. So that, that was a kind of recurrent motif. And over time, I began to question some of these moving statements and I thought, Okay, that's very compelling, but come on, if you hadn't had David, you'd have some other child who perhaps wouldn't have Down syndrome and who doubtless would have been lovable in his own way. And what I came to think was that it didn't really matter whether the meaning that parents described was something that was organically there or something that was constructed. What mattered was whether they were able to achieve a perception of meaning. And I found that those people who were able to achieve such a perception were actually able to be better parents to happier children than people who couldn't. And so I ended up not thinking critically, oh, come on, that's ridiculous. Your child is a nightmare. What are you talking about? Um, but rather thinking, OK, if you found a way through it. And there has now been some interesting clinical research. There was a group of women who were interviewed shortly after giving birth to a disabled child. And they were asked about finding meaning. Children had similar levels of disability. They were matched accordingly. 
The children were then tested at two years old. The children whose mothers constructed meaning from the experience were doing much better at two years old than the children whose mothers had not done so. So that process of constructing meaning is important, and it is authentic, and it is also sometimes somewhat artificial, and it functions at all of those levels. Um, I did a lot of work on autism, um, and again, Culturing Harbor has been amazing. The autism research that's going on here is extraordinary and has been inspiring, and I was very glad to learn a great deal from it, uh, and I'm very grateful to Bruce and to Jan and to others who helped facilitate that. Um, but I also spent a lot of time with the families of children with autism and looked at the various ways in which they struggle to deal with those children. And as I did that, um, I was very struck by the fact that autism is a term that covers such a wide range of experience. There are people who have autism who are essentially high-functioning scientists, some of whom possibly work at this institution. Um, and there are people who have autism who are children sitting in a corner and banging their heads against the wall with no language and an appearance, at least, of relative misery. Um, one of the people who I was interviewing was somebody who was, again, actually, in this instance, someone who was, does not have many advantages or much education, but who has worked a lot on having an autistic child. And she got these interns who would come and help her take care of her child. And she had a, a system that she had. When they arrived, she would say to them, OK, she would say, so we're just going to do a little training exercise, she said. And actually, it's going to be great for you, because if you get it right, I'll give you $200. And the interns would say, oh, great. And she would say, OK, just come into this other room. And she would come into the room, and it would be dark, and there would be all of these other interns who were working for her in there, and you know the kid's sister and so on. And they would be making weird clicking noises and snapping their fingers and making nonsensical remarks. And the person would come in and said, what am I supposed to do? And they would keep saying, come on, come on, find it, and we'll give you $200. She kept saying, what am I supposed to find? And they said, find it, find it, and we'll give you $200. Jay said, that's the life of autistic children. They walk in there. They don't understand what's happening. None of it makes sense. Everyone is trying to get them to do something. They're being off. They can't sort it out. It's all overwhelming and confusing. And I thought it was a wonderful way of describing what the experience of autism is. Um, there are two attitudes toward autism. I mean, there are many attitudes. But there are essentially two, the illness and the identity one. The illness one says that we need to find a way to cure autism. And I think if we could alleviate the suffering of people who have got severe autism and who are miserable, it would be amazing. And again, I, you know, I hope I will never have a child who is autistic. I think it's unbelievably steep and difficult. But there are also many people who have autism who have extraordinary splinter skills. Some of you were probably at the uh, Double Helix dinner at which Temple Grandin received an award her autism has been the basis for what she has been able to do. She has designed cattle handling equipment, now used in the majority of US plants. It's used around the world. And she said that she felt as though it was the ways in which her mind functioned differently that allowed her to conceptualize that equipment. And I won't go into the details, but it's quite extraordinary what she's been able to do. And I said to her at one point, I said, but isn't there a conflict between having autism, which is this disabling thing, and having this genius for this line of work. And she said, genius is an abnormality, too. Yeah. Um, so, and the question of what's going on, I'll read just because I'm here at Cold Spring Harbor. I was talking to Mike Wiggler, and I said, you know, the genetic research is quite confusing. There are all of these genes that increase vulnerability, but the correlations seem to be erratic, and so on and so forth. And he talked a lot about the interplay between, um, between the genes and the rest of somebody's character or the rest of somebody's genome. He said, there is probably an interplay between personality and the deficit. You and I could have similar deficiencies, but we would make different choices. It sounds odd that a two-year-old may be making a choice about what he can and can't handle, but they probably do. You could have two kids that grow up in the same impoverished environment, and one joins the priesthood, and the other becomes a thief, right? I think that can happen internally. I was very interested by that idea, and I've been very much compelled by his research. Um, 
And I then became very interested in how this question of identity plays out for people with autism. And I looked quite a lot at the autism rights movement, in which there are many people who are very high functioning in some areas, many of them not very high functioning by usual standards in a lot of other areas, but who seem to find meaning in what they have. And I saw that that was great for them, and in a way great for humanity, because many of them had abilities, as Temple Grandin does, that don't exist in non-autistic people. I'll just um, read to you, this is from the mother of someone with um, moderate autism. She said, the word incurable is quite devastating sounding, but you can also look at it as being that autism is durable. Looking at this jewel through different facets does not trivialize the challenges of people who have tremendous obstacles. I'm trying to look at the whole picture, including the beautiful part of it. Autism is as much a part of our humanity as the capacity to dream. God manifests all possibilities, and this is one of the possibilities in our world. It's a part of the human condition, or conditions, as the case may be. But as I did the work on autism, I was really struck by a larger problem that the um, illness definition has carried with it. And that is a problem which I will um, uh, describe to you now. Um, there we are. This is just a very, very, very abbreviated list. In 1996, Charles Antoine Blay, age six, was killed by his mother, who did no jail time, but served one year in a halfway house, and then was appointed as a public representative by Montreal's Société de l'Autisme. In 1997, Casey Albury, age 17, was strangled by her mother with a bathrobe cord after refusing to jump off a bridge. Her mother said to the police, she was a misfit. People were scared of her because she was different. I wish it could have been quicker. I'd wanted to kill her for a long time she received a sentence of 18 months. In 1998, sorry, yes, 1998, Pierre Pasquieu was drowned by his mother, who was given a suspended sentence. In 1999, James Joseph Cummings Jr., at the age of 46, was stabbed to death by his father inside the residential facility where he lived. That same year, Daniel Lubner, age 13, was burned alive by his mother who was sentenced to six years in prison. In 2001, Gabriel Britt, age six, was suffocated by his father, who dumped his body in a lake and then received a suspended sentence for pleading guilty to a lesser crime. I can go on like this. It's about two pages in the book. But it points to what happens when one starts looking at something that is a condition in many ways as an illness, which is A, that there are all of these people who feel that if they can't make their child non-autistic, they've failed which is a big issue for many of these parents. But B, when the courts say that these people who have murdered their own children, and as I say, there are six or eight of them every single year on record um, in this country, um, when you have all of those people receiving very light sentences, it sends a message. And the message it sends is that those really aren't people in the same way. If you murdered a healthy child, you wouldn't get a suspended sentence. You wouldn't get 18 months in jail you would get a much more severe punishment. And the proposal, the proposition, that because these children are difficult to deal with, that the appropriate way to respond to it, or an acceptable way to respond to it, is by murdering them, is an unbelievably dangerous supposition, which is surprisingly frequent in the society that we inhabit. One of the things that was interesting to me as I looked at these conditions is that many of them, like autism, which seem poisonous when there's a great deal of it there, actually can seem quite meaningful when they're there in a more limited way. And I came to an idea that mental illnesses are often, Bruce and I were talking about this last night, are often useful in small quantities. Um, I'm going to read you something that was said by a, a very famous novelist who's won a Pulitzer Prize talking about her brother who has schizophrenia. She said, somehow, I feel like we're twins. There's been almost nothing he's explained that I haven't felt I could extrapolate from my own experience. I'm a fiction writer, and he is also a fiction writer in his way. He creates other worlds. At times, he's lived in other worlds. There are characters, there are planets, 
He has a great aesthetic sense, and that infuses his delusions. It's a very dangerous, scary, lonely world, but it also has moments of beauty in it. My mother deserves huge credit for just never giving up. My stepfather couldn't stay in there fighting. It was too painful for him, but it brought out the warrior in my mother. It's my mother, the doctors, and most of all, Harry. He's someone who's been in Vietnam for 15 years. He still gets up and finds things to be joyful about. Would I have the stomach for the life he has? I'm not sure I would. And I thought that was a very interesting point, and again, it's a point that's now supported that actually the biological mechanisms of creativity and the biological uh, mechanisms of insanity can be closely correlated. This is a genetics lab, so I'll also quote just a sentence from a family in which the father's two brothers have schizophrenia. The family registered to be in a study um, up at McLean because they were so concerned about trying to figure out whether they had the genes, which um, is something that can't be adequately determined at this point. Um, Frida said to me, we sit by the phone waiting to find out what the gene is so we can test the kids. And I think when one looks at the kind of genetic research that's going on here, some of it is really very interesting simply because genetics are fascinating. But the urgency of the genetic questions that are being addressed at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory and that are being discussed here really would be hard to exaggerate. Um, I'm going to describe just one other person from the realm of schizophrenia. Um, this is someone named Susan Weinreich who had unbelievably severe schizophrenia. So there was a point when she didn't shower or brush her teeth for seven years. She was lost in a world of delusions. And she described emerging from it. I remember the first time I felt love after all that. I don't even remember who it was. Probably Sam, her doctor. I just started feeling what it felt like to love someone. I don't remember it being ecstatic. I just remember it feeling like when I would go fishing as a young girl and a sunfish would catch the hook. Just that tug on the other end of the line. After all those years of being so isolated within myself and so discontented, the medication sucked out some of the symptoms. And as the psychosis receded, it left room for my heart to grow. Um, one is torn in the face of stories like that. There are many people whose schizophrenia is intractable. Schizophrenia, I think, is the least convincing of the identity movements I looked at, in part because you're born with autism. You've had it all your life. It is who you are. If you try to imagine someone without their autism, you're imagining a different person. In fact, there's one famous autism activist who said, when I hear parents say, I wish my child didn't have autism, what they're really saying is, I wish my child would disappear and a stranger I could love would move in behind his face. So that's a very strong statement in that direction. But then you hear that story from someone like Susan and you think the medical miracle of being able, I mean, if she had lived 30 or 40 years ago, it's likely she would never have emerged. The medication to which she was finally responsive didn't exist then. And so both kinds of progress are very important. The cultural progress, the progress in acceptance, the progress in respecting difference, as well as the medical progress, the scientific process, the process in understanding what conditions people have and how they can be treated. And a lot of the time, people's relationship to the children goes through that extraordinary turnaround. So there is one mother of two children with very severe disabilities, neither of whom could walk or talk. One of them drowned in his group home when a nurse was giving him a bath and left the room to get a towel. Um, and she talked about how frustrating it was. And she said, at his grave, at the funeral, she said, let me bury here the rage I feel to have been robbed twice, once of the child I wanted and once of the son I loved. Um, so that's a, that's a focus. That's a focus, and it's a concern. And I talk to people a lot about where this discovery of meaning and love came from. This is from someone else who also, uh, coincidentally, had two severely disabled children. She said, and it was very striking because it's the opposite of what some people had said, I actually think it's not believing in God that has given us that perspective. People always regale us with these little sayings, 
like God doesn't give you any more than you can handle. But children like ours are not preordained as a gift. They're a gift because that's what we have chosen. These categories seem to hold through all of the conditions I've just described, all of which are essentially conditions that we think of as disease states. I was very interested in looking at how well they held if one moved on, which is the sort of second half of the book, to conditions that are not disease states, but rather appear to be socially determined. I wrote about prodigies because I wanted to demonstrate that actually it could be just as difficult to have a child who is a genius as it is to have a child who is severely disabled, and that really prodigious talent of an extraordinary kind occurs very early. And I saved that chapter for research purposes until toward the end, because I thought, I'm hearing a lot of really difficult and painful stories, and it would be great if I had the cheerful thing waiting up ahead of me. And then I got to it, and I discovered that while the lovely surprise about people dealing with Down syndrome and autism and all of these other things is that horrible though it sounds, there's good stuff in it, the big surprise about prodigies is that, lovely though it sounds, there's a lot of horrible stuff in it. So it was looking at the way that people got through that. And a lot of the people who I met really had extraordinary talent very early. Veda Kaplinsky, who is a teacher of piano at Juilliard and probably the leading educator for young musicians in the world, um, said, genius is an abnormality, just like Temple Grandin. Genius is an abnormality, and abnormalities do not come one at a time. Many gifted kids have ADD or OCD or Asperger's. When the parents are confronted with two sides of a kid, they're so quick to acknowledge the positive, the talented, the exceptional. They're in denial over everything else. And there were a lot of different attitudes toward those children and toward that experience of denial. Um, there was one young man whom, young man, I guess, kid, whom I interviewed, Mark Yu, who was seven when I interviewed him. He looked about five because he was quite tiny. And I went to the house and he said, come upstairs and I'll show you my favorite cartoons. And I went upstairs, we watched some cartoons, and he had a poster of Cookie Monster on the wall. And then he said, let's go downstairs and I'll play you the Chopin Fantasy Impromptu. <laughs> and we went downstairs and he did this stupefying performance. I mean, I don't know that it was sort of quite at the level of um, Horowitz, but he just sat down in this power, and it's a complicated piece of music that relates to emotional states that really are pretty foreign to most people at that age. And I had said to his mother earlier on when she was describing, I mean, he practices for seven hours a day. He goes once a month. He flies to China to have supplemental piano lessons in Shanghai. He has them at home in California. It was a whole. And I said to her, do you worry at all about his having a normal childhood? So we went downstairs, he played the Chopin Fantasy Impromptu, and she turned to me and said, he's not a normal child. Why should he have a normal childhood? It was a very striking take uh, on the whole issue and on the whole problem. Um, I talked to families who were bringing up children conceived in rape because I wanted to demonstrate that what has happened to a woman and what has happened to her can determine an identity for her child. Um, and Again, because I wanted to look at all of these standards of acceptance and tolerance and love and so on. This is what one of the people I interviewed said to me. Um, my grandchildren are my heartbeat. I didn't think that I could love like that, and I didn't love like that with my own children. Maybe I was too young, maybe the rape, but when I felt that love, I had to let the rape go. I've asked myself, if I ever saw my attackers in the streets, would I recognize them? The shadowy faces I visualize could be anyone. I depersonalized it. The rape was there, but it was an act, not people. All I know is I have something that these people will never know. Never know that they have a beautiful daughter. Never know that they have beautiful grandchildren. They'll never know, but I do. And so, as it turns out, I'm the lucky one. And I thought if someone could manage to come to that construction and that take on a particularly, I mean, even for me doing a whole chapter on it, a particularly brutal rape, that seemed to me to be extraordinary. <laughs> 
It then led me into the research I did on crime, which was a very intense process. One of the families I interviewed was the family of Dylan Klebold, who committed the Columbine Massacre. Um, and his family hadn't talked to anyone. I went out to talk to them. They were very hesitant about talking. And then once they started, they sort of, they couldn't stop. And at the end of our first day of interviews, I said, so if Dylan were here now, is there anything you'd want to ask him or anything you'd want to tell him? And his father said, I sure would. I'd like to ask him what the hell he thought he was doing. And his mother looked down, and she thought for a minute, and then she said, I would ask him to forgive me for being his mother and never knowing what was going on inside his head. And three years later, when I was having dinner with her, she suddenly just volunteered. They're extraordinary people. I thought meeting them would somehow explain what happened. And I'm here to tell you, if any of you have young children or grandchildren, people can be unknowable. And the Klebolds were lovely. I would be perfectly happy. I mean, I'm quite attached to my own parents, but I would have been happy to have them as parents. They're really and genuinely lovely people, and this just happened to them. And where it came from or how it happened is genuinely unknowable. But when I had dinner with Sue um, a, a few years after that original interview, we were sitting down and she said to me, um, I'll read it to you, in fact, word for word since I have it. When it first happened, I used to wish that I had never had children, that I had never married. If Tom and I hadn't crossed paths at Ohio State, Dylan wouldn't have existed, and this terrible thing wouldn't have happened. But over time, I've come to feel that for myself, I am glad I had kids, and glad I had the kids I did. Because the love for them, even at the price of this pain, has been the single greatest joy of my life. When I say that, I am speaking of my own pain and not of the pain of other people. But I accept my own pain. Life is full of suffering, and this is mine. I know it would have been better for the world if Dylan had never been born. But I believe it would not have been better for me. I'm going to wrap up by talking about um, uh, about the fact that I decided in the course of the time that I was working on this book, John and I decided to have children, um, and I do have children, and it's been a very joyful apotheosis, uh, I think, for us all together. And a lot of people said, gosh, if I'd been working on that book, I don't think I ever could have had children. And I said, on the contrary, I said, what this book showed me is that, that everyone really is lovable, and that this experience of extreme difference that we're looking at is only the more extreme version of something that's endemic to all relations between parents and children. Effectively, that every child is mysterious or strange or different in some measure or in some degree, and that the same way that you can tell whether a construction material is valid by testing it at super temperatures it will never encounter, you can tell a lot about what it means to be a parent by looking at these more extreme cases and trying to understand what they are. And I kept thinking, these parents keep saying, I wouldn't give my child up for anything in the world. I love, even with children who were so disabled, even what Sue Klebold had to say about Dylan Klebold, I thought, don't be ridiculous. You would have a better life if you hadn't <laughs> had that child. She's been a pariah. I mean, the horror that family has gone through is beyond anything. And then I really stopped and thought about it. And I thought, OK. Imagine if some glorious angel came through the living room ceiling and said to me, I'm going to take away your children and give you others instead who will be brighter and more attractive and nicer and better behaved. Whatever the category is, you know, I would cling to my children and, and pray that awful specter away. And I think that it's the nature of parental love that one becomes attached. One becomes attached through the process of someone else's dependency and one becomes attached through negotiating the course of somebody else's pain. And that the decisions of these parents to say, I love the child I had, are really not so different from the decisions that all of us make about the child we have. I'm going to read you the closing uh, few sentences of the book, um, in which I talked about the fact that actually when our son was born, we were told initially that he appeared to have brain damage. Turned out he didn't, but I thought, 
oh God, I've been writing about it and now it's actually happening to me, and then he emerged from it. And I thought afterwards, hmm, constructing meaning. I certainly didn't want that experience, and if I could go back and erase it, I'd love to. It was very upsetting. But there was also strength to be found in it. Children ensnared me the moment I connected fatherhood with loss. But I am not sure I would have noticed that if I hadn't been immersed in this research. Encountering so much strange love, I fell into its bewitching patterns and saw how splendor can illuminate even the most abject vulnerabilities. I had witnessed and learned the terrifying joy of unbearable responsibility, recognized how it conquers everything else. Sometimes I had thought the heroic parents in this book were fools, enslaving themselves to a life's journey with their alien children, trying to breed identity out of misery. I was startled to learn that my research had built me a plank and that I was ready to join them on their ship. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, such an eloquent and compelling story, if you don't want to read this book. Um, <laughs> That's another uh, disorder that Andrew should study. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Wonderful. As I said, um, there are books available, and Andrew has agreed to sign them after we have a little bit of lunch. So thank you very much for coming to this President's Council. I hope you enjoyed all of the talks and uh, lunches in the cafe. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. you don't need to change that. <laughs> it's uh, perfect. Thank you. Uh,